and welcome to today's webinar, Building a Project Vision and Coalition to Unlock Funding. My name is Mary Ellen Coombs. I lead the collaborative here at Rails to Trails Conservancy, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Kelly Pack, our Senior Director of Trail Development, who will be serving as today's moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy's Trail Nation Collaborative. The collaborative is a nationwide peer learning community that brings together advocates, leaders, and professionals from across disciplines to work together to establish and accelerate connected trail and active transportation networks across the country. To date, we have over 6,000 people signed up for the collaborative. The collaborative provides proven tools, methods, and resources, including the Trail Nation Playbook. Combined with RTC's expertise and that of you, our network of partners across the country, we come together to find solutions to challenges and barriers, working to accelerate the development of connected trail systems in all of our communities. This opportunity is free and open to all. We welcome professionals and advocates in the trail and active transportation and adjacent fields. This is our first session in the Trail, trail Nation Playbook in Action webinar series that we'll be revisiting throughout the year. Thanks, Mary Ellen, and welcome everyone. It's great to be joined by so many of you who are part of the Trail Nation Collaborative. And looking at the registration list, we know that we have lots of folks from that represent different sectors from different parts of the country. And we just wanna thank you for joining us today. And for those of you who provided questions beforehand that we hope we'll get to um, in the Q&A. So I just wanna start off um, by talking a little bit about the Trail Nation playbook. With the launch of the Trail Nation Collaborative, we were also pleased to finally offer and publish what we call the playbook. It's an online resource and guide for creating multi-use trail networks. Over the past decade or so, we've been working with hundreds of partners like you across nine of the Trail Nation projects to envision, plan, organize, fund, and activate trail networks. These Trail Nation projects serve as a learning laboratory for understanding effective strategies to accelerate trail network development. As we began documenting lessons learned and effective practices of trail network development, six different elements emerged as critical to the process. Project vision, coalition building, mapping and analytics, gap filling, investment strategy, and engagement. Many of you know that the process of developing a single trail, let alone a whole trail network, is not linear, and there's not really a one-size-fits-all approach that can be easily replicated. While different communities and regions might have to take different approaches based on their unique circumstances, we are seeing these integrated elements as core to success. The playbook curates case studies, effective practices, and tools as a resource to trail planners, municipalities, states, and regions that are seeking to advance their own regional trail network projects. This webinar is the first in a series that will highlight all six elements of the playbook. We encourage you to visit and explore the playbook as there are many specific examples, tools, and lessons that we will build on in continued conversation with you, the Trail Nation Collaborative. These webinar discussions highlight the application of some of the tools you'll find in the playbook and will help paint a more detailed picture of how different regions and coalitions are approaching this work. We're especially interested in learning about how communities and regions are using these strategies to unlock funding opportunities, especially with the increase of funding and expanded eligibilities that we now have under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Today, we're gonna to focus on two elements of the playbook that are often complementary: project vision and coalition building. Establishing the vision for a regional trail network is the initial step in determining its scope and the primary impact it will deliver, be that transportation, recreation, tourism, or quality of life. And coalitions are critical to the success of trail networks. Designing an inclusive process to engage a broad network of partners can help to channel the energy, expertise, and influence needed to grow, support for, and implement regional trail networks. So with that, we are so thrilled today to bring together a panel with unique and varied perspectives on these topics. We're joined by Judy Quisenberry, Executive Director of the Valley Baptist Legacy Foundation in the Lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas, Michelle Pert, Senior Program Officer at the William Penn Foundation in Greater Philadelphia. 
These two panelists represent foundations that were instrumental in helping to convene and establish regional trail networks. And we're also joined by Shay Strait, the Director of Planning for the City of Fairmont, West Virginia. Shay brings the perspective of a municipal planner that is utilizing the vision of a large regional trail network to accelerate important trail connections in his city. So as we get started, we're just gonna take a moment with the first question to each panelist to, to kind of quickly orient our audience to where we are um, and where each of you are, are coming from. So starting with the circuit trails, which is an incredible trail network with more than 300 miles of existing trails and a goal to reach 500 miles by 2025. And it is within nine counties in both Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I'm not gonna read the vision statement for each of these. You can find them on the playbook, but I just wanna highlight that within a lot of the vision statements or mission of the coalitions, you will see interesting things like the amount of people that this coalition wants to impact through the development of the network or maybe an emphasis area like active transportation. And then of course, we're gonna to touch on the impact and importance of a diversified coalition to advance trail networks in these different sized regions. And for the circuit, it is very, very diverse, including local, regional, state, and national organizations that all play a role in helping to accelerate this vision. So Michelle, we're gonna get started with you and wanted you to just build on this introduction and begin to describe how the William Penn Foundation was involved in developing the vision of the circuit trails. Yeah, absolutely. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here and um, I commend Rails to Trails for putting together this playbook, which is really um, fantastic. Um, as Kelly said, I'm Michelle Perch with the William Penn Foundation. Um, we're based here in Philadelphia on the traditional homeland of the Lenape people. Um, and before getting into how the foundation was involved in the vision of the circuit trails, just give a quick, quick background on the foundation. Um, we support education, creative communities, and watershed protection in the greater Philadelphia region, and we're the largest environmental funder in the region. Um, so I'm part of the Watershed Protection Program, which is focused on creating the conditions for a healthy Delaware River watershed. And to us, one sign of a healthy watershed is that people can equitably access and enjoy clean rivers and streams. So one way that we're supporting that access is through the development of multi-purpose trails, and that's where the circuit trails comes in. Um, more than half of the circuit trails, 800 planned 800 miles um, run adjacent to waterways um, as seen here in this photo, which um, is the Schuylkill River Trail right around the corner from my house um, or, or the Ben Franklin Bridge um, behind me crossing the Delaware River. Um, so the, the William Penn Foundation has valued trail development since the 1990s. Um, we've been through several strategy shifts since then, but trails have been a consistent priority and now sit within the Watershed Protection Program. Um, in 2009 or so, the foundation and other government fund funders started noticing that there were entities working on trail segments that connected to each other, um, but the organizations themselves weren't coordinating with each other on grant applications or um, more broadly to the extent that we wanted to see. And so when we realized this, um, we supported a set of organizations to plan out a grant application package for um, the TIGER program to begin the build out of the trail system in the urban core in Philadelphia and Camden. Um, and they won a $23 million grant in a really competitive pool. Um, we learned later that the Department of Transportation had funded the, the build out um, because it was a regional by state effort and done in a really coordinated way. Um, so that was what, what provided the impetus um, for the foundation to invest $10 million in capital through the region's metropolitan planning organization to leverage more of those public dollars. So that was really just like a, a very powerful example of what partnership and vision can do and gave us that confidence. Um, over the next couple of years in between 2010 and 2012, the foundation supported strategic planning of the coalition, early mapping, um, a naming contest, um, early branding, and then the Circuit Trails Coalition was born in 2012. Um, 
And today the circuit trails has over 375 miles built. It's covering nine counties and two states. Um, there's a goal to complete 500 miles by 2025 and to complete the network by 2040. Um, so the Circuit Trails Coalition is really focused on building out the trail network and advocating for funding. It's also focusing on promoting and encouraging use of trails and fostering learning across the many organizations that are part of the coalition. Um, and those organizations include more than 65 nonprofits working in various sectors, transportation, recreation, health, um, environment economic development, and they help to, again, develop, manage the trails, promote the trails, and program and advocate for them. Um, these nonprofits work in collaboration with many state and local agencies, and they work really closely with um, the region's Metropolitan Planning Organization, which um, sits on the steering committee of the Circuit Trails Coalition. Um, and I just saw a question in the chat. I'm not following all of them, but they are multi-purpose um, trails, all of these, these 800 miles. Um, the foundation funds a lot of the organizations in the Circuit Trails Coalition through individual grants. And we support three organizations to really lead the coalition, um, develop the agenda, uh, provide projects on behalf of the, of the Full Circuit Coalition. Um, and we also continue to support capital grants to the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, and then I'll just end by saying that in 2021, 2022, the Circuit Trails developed a new strategic plan um, for three years that resulted in a continuation of their goal to expand the trail network and, and get funding um, to advance the miles of trails. But there's also an expanded focus on increasing the diversity of trail users and reducing barriers affecting use and accessibility, um, and also strengthening the coalition's ability to effectively represent the communities along the trails. So thinking about what the representation um, of the organizations within the coalition will look like in order to have the greatest impact. Um, and the foundation grants align with um, the strategic plan goals. And there are, you know, by nature of the strategic plan um, and the coordinated effort that the coalition put together, there are really clear roles and responsibilities for each organization to carry out those goals. So um, I'll end there. It's been really a pleasure to see this uh, coalition evolve and to, to support it and learn from everyone. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think you know you'll see a lot of the examples you talked about, including collaboration with your metropolitan uh, planning organization, as key to what we're seeing. Um, you know, success in really accelerating trail network development because um, we all know it takes a lot of time to do the the planning work um, and often to get the right of way and acquire funding. Um, and that seems to be you know one of the keys to success and is, is highlighted in the playbook as well. So we'll go next to South Texas, to Cameron County and the Caracara Trails Network. Um, the Caracara Trails Network proposes more than 400 miles of active transportation infrastructure, including multi-use trails, a really cool paddling net, uh, trail network, and more than 100 miles of US bike route on street system too. So all of that integrated together. And the, the vision of the Caracara Trails, as Judy will talk about, was really um, a part of a planning effort to look at active transportation and tourism in the valley. And the coalition just kind of very briefly, you know, it's really started by including all of the different municipalities within, within Cameron County, and then some other key anchor institutions as well, like the University of Texas. And then of course, a lot of the federal agencies that have lots of different lands across the county. So with that, Judy, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I know you and Michelle share similar perspectives, both being um, from foundations and the regions that you're working in are really different and the way trail development aligns with your foundation's goals and priorities might be a, a bit different as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about the genesis of Caracara Trails and the foundation's role? Sure. Um, I'm Judy Quisenberry, the Executive Director for Valley Baptist Legacy Foundation, and we're a newer funder um, than William Penn. We were established in 2011 as the result of the sale of a local hospital. So we've been funding um, grants since 2014, and our focus is health-related. So um, trails and parks sort of fit into our healthy lifestyle wellness um, section of our portfolio. 
and uh, and we look at it as long term investments that have really lasting benefits versus um, the funding that we do for programs. So uh, we're excited about the many trails that we've helped municipalities put in the ground. And the this was the result of an active plan project that the city of Brownsville actually began um, and get, sent us a, an application. And it was a $200,000 request. And we ended up funding $100,000 and requested that all the municipalities in Cameron County kind of ante up the other half. So they did that in, um, in a way that made sense for the size community they were. Brownsville being the largest, um, did 30,000. And then Harlingen was the next largest and gave, I think, 20. And then the rest did about 10. So everyone had a little skin in the game to start with. And I think that that was a real important piece of their own commitment to the beginning of this project. And that planning process was really key in really cementing everybody's commitment to the vision behind this. Um, our part of, of Texas is the poorest area in the state. And we're in the top four poorest areas in the country. So our view from a foundation perspective is, you know, health disparities and the infrastructure that lacks um, the buildup that we would like to see in other parts of our own state. So we will, you know, continue to work with this coalition. They, one of the things they did early on is get experts at the table to help guide that and Rails to Trails was one of them. And that was one of the key things to helping this coalition form and, and have kind of some vision that would sustain through the difficult parts of, of the building. And now that we are, I don't know, eight years into this, I can tell you that it's it's gone through periods of difficulty and keeping the excitement going and um, funding has always been just a little bit of an obstacle. So I'm sure we'll talk more about those sorts of obstacles going forward. But um, but so far, it's been a rewarding experience as a foundation to be a part of that coalition and to continue to watch our area build out. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks so much, Judy. I think one of the things, another thing that we hear pretty frequently is that vibrant leadership is really a part of what makes these coalitions strong. And you have um, a, a lot of really vibrant leaders and shared leadership, uh, leadership there in, in Cameron County. And um, it is a, a truly unique and special trail network. Um, I encourage everybody to check out Kara Kara Trails online and um, see what their plans are in the future. Um, and I'm going to go next, we're going to go to the Industrial Heartland. Um, the Industri Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition is comprised of more than 50 counties in four states, West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and one county in New York. Um, it is almost halfway complete, and it has a vision of more than 1,500 miles of shared use trails connecting many communities in the industrial heartland region and with the vision really to establish that region as a premier destination um, that includes a, a, a very vibrant trail network. The coalition is made up of dozens and dozens of partners. So everything from local trail groups to municipalities, convention, convention and visitors bureaus, um, to state-wide uh, advocacy groups like the Pennsylvania Environmental Council, um, RTC, the National Park Services, Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program all help to, to lead in the, in, in the Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition. We're gonna zoom in a bit because this is kind of our, our largest trail network that we're discussing. And we're gonna go to a single municipality within that region, Fairmont, West Virginia. And Shay, you're primarily focused on trail and active transportation projects within the city of Fairmont because you're the director of planning there. But tell us a little bit more about how the larger mega regional trail network that we just saw factors into the city's efforts to close important trail gaps. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm Shay Strait, director of planning and development for the city of Fairmont uh, here in West Virginia. 
And Fairmont's really fortunate to be part of the Parkersburg to Pittsburgh corridor within the IHTC. And with it, our municipality um, in its entirety, actually the entire length of our city is one of only four gaps that remain in the state of West Virginia within that particular corridor. And the only gap that's entirely within a municipal boundary. So most of the rest of them lie within uh, uh, rural areas and the counties. So with that, Fairmont is actually in a position to be a leader of getting the first of the four gaps closed uh, because the city ha has jurisdiction over the entirety of that four and a half mile gap that we have. It's challenging for Fairmont because of being in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains and in a small city. We're the eighth largest in West Virginia, but we're still a small city. Um, and the majority of the land that is needed sits over 60 feet above the water level of the Monongahela River that uh, flows through the middle of our city. And, um, and actually behind me, the image behind me is the West Fork of the Monongahela River, uh, which is currently one of our two points where the trail terminates. So the completion of the trail will require five different former railroad corridors, millions of dollars in bridges that cross the Mon River and multiple draws, uh, various uh, steep slope valleys there, and then substantial stormwater management to prevent riverbank erosion and a lot of public safety considerations because of how much of the trail that will initially be out of line of sight of much of the developed area of our city. So um, in some ways, the mountains and the rivers do help us focus on what is necessary because the community is very limited and how we can get this implemented. Well, this made the P2P study that was completed years ago uh, a very core part of our success in being able to study the corridor in a coalition format because the city took action to implement the new trail right away and had a clear vision for how to do that. Fairmont's also part of kind of the, that's why we call it the Industrial Heartlands Trail Corridor. We're part of the Rust Belt region of the Northeast here and have all that industrial legacy stuff. Um, so the entire riverfront within our city has been undermined, uh, and I'm not kidding, nearly every linear foot of mountainside in Fairmont is mined. Uh, we were the number one uh, coal mining city in the U.S. Uh, during the earlier part of the 20th century. And we had numerous other industries related to that uh, here as well, and particularly related to the Pittsburgh historical uh, industries as well. So we had coking, oil refinement, glass making, metal fabrication, and much more. All of this located right there on those rail corridors, of course. Um, everything and everywhere is a brownfield in Fairmont. Uh, so that makes this coalition even more important because uh, those are always challenging. We needed those partners to help us overcome those challenges in this. Uh, so the city needs support with the cleanup of these riverfront properties to not only make the trail safe, but to also develop the amenities along the trail that uh, such as new housing and new businesses. Luckily for Fairmont, the West Virginia Northern Brownfields Assistance Center in Morgantown is one of those amazing coalition partners and just north of us in Morgantown along an existing trail uh, that goes into Pennsylvania there. So with that, the city and the proposed trail runs north to south. This gives Fairmont an opportunity to use the trail connection to bring multimodal transportation uh, to all of our neighborhoods, safe routes to schools and recreational spaces all across the city. Um, so this with that study, that P2P study showcased that and gave us that unique opportunity, which once again, emphasized the need for our coalition and to work with a multitude of partners there. Um, so it's truly something that can be beneficial and even transformational across all four and a half mile gap that we have. Uh, that takes the project from just a get it done perspective, right? Because we're one of only four gaps remaining. Uh, West Virginia is in a very great spot with IHDC where we don't have that many gaps left to close, uh, unlike our neighboring states. Uh, but with that, we can now make every possible, um, we can analyze every possible connection to see how everyone can benefit, making our partnerships even more important. Uh, so finally, one of the things we're doing as part of our coalition of partnership is we're publishing everything we're doing, uh, right? Brag about it, talk about it, keep, stay in touch. The city wants to pressure and inspire its neighboring communities to also close their gaps and do wonderful things in the places where the trails will be. Uh, for Fairmont, for example, it was great to see the Sheepskin Trail in Pennsylvania to start being built out. Uh, they got to work on that right away after the P2P study was completed. And it was great because that helps create that energy because locally, politically, people saw that and they're like, oh, why aren't we doing anything? There are, somebody has to be the first and uh, it's always nice when somebody else is because it motivates everybody else too. Um, 
And so they got started building their trail extension. It won't completely close the gap to Pittsburgh uh, from their community, but they're working on building those extra miles out. And it demonstrated that Fairmont and all of West Virginia was part of this larger initiative, right? Seeing a city in another state work on this was really helped cement that. Already Harrison County Commission, which is the county south of Marion County where we reside, has been calling us asking for technical advice and support on implementing their trail gaps as well. And they're hard at work on theirs too. Uh, once again, using exactly the study that was completed as part of this coalition. Um, we've also had neighboring communities in Grafton and Barrickville, which are east and west of us. Our trail runs north south. So the lateral communities are now calling and they're like, how do we become part of this? We want, we're seeing all this great, the great things you are doing. And we want to get into it. And so it's really creating this effort to really be part of something bigger and bring all these people to the table and especially the way the Fairmont's doing it. Because we're talking about it from so many different lenses, so many different perspectives. And that's uh, really what's been key about the coalition for us. Thanks so much, Shay. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and then come back to it when we ask you a follow-up question here in a bit, but wanted to turn it back to Judy and Michelle, um, just to kind of further reflect on how you've seen the vision of each of the networks that you're working with in and the coalition support the advancement of the trail network itself and, and inverse, what, what have been some of the barriers or challenges that you've seen? I don't know if, Judy, you wanna start off how the vision is really supported continuing advancement of the trail gaps, closing trail gaps? Um, sure. I think one of the coolest parts about the initial kind of brainstorming was it really made everyone look at their own assets and think about what are the things that are interesting about my area? What are the things that bring tourists? We're one of the largest birding corridors in the United States. And so that is, you know, an area of interest for many we also have a battlefield, a national battlefield park that one of our first trails actually goes through. So that that partnership that came from working with multiple groups was really important. And to get that piece done, I think, was the part that enabled everyone to believe that other pieces are possible. However, I will say COVID um, didn't help our coalition at all because you know, when the world stopped, so did this coalition and several others that, that we find not related to trails, but any kind of group activity, all the momentum sort of slowed way down on that. Um, I think one of the other, I love, Shay, that you talked about kind of the competitive nature of municipalities, but I also think that though that works, it's always like, well, what's my municipality going to get from this? So sometimes it, it gets a little bit more self-focused and and they they struggle to set to think, you know what, if my community wins, everyone wins, and they just sort of can, you know, really only focus on their one little municipality and lose sight of the bigger picture. So trying to continue to make sure that everyone has the vision for the collective, I think is really important. And I love also, Michelle, that you talked about the Tiger Grant really being awarded for that regional collective thinking. And that's something I think we need to keep in front of coalitions to know that that's the hard work, but it is also the real rewarding work. And when we can do things on a regional basis and collaborate, really everyone stands a chance of winning far better than if we're just out there doing something on our own. Thanks for that, Judy. Yeah, and I was kind of, Michelle, also thinking about, you know, the, that early success in getting the TIGER grant. Um, and certainly, I'm, I'm sure the coalition played into that, but also wanted to hear your perspective on how the vision has impacted the circuit trails. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for the circuit trails, there's been um, just an amazing communications effort since the very beginning that I want to highlight um, and shout out to Rails to Trails for, um, for doing that. Um, you know, in, in our region, there are so many, and, and I think in all regions, there's so many reasons to, to use trails, right? There's commuting and the recreational benefits and just enjoying nature. Um, and I think that the 
you know, the communications effort has done a really good job with um, branding the Circuit Trails Coalition, the, the Circuit Trails Network across the region and all of the many reasons why the trails can help you and, and really personalizing the message to a diverse array of users um, about why the trails could be something that they might want to utilize. Um, and then elevating that message up to the decision makers. Um, so there have been a number of efforts that the coalition has undertaken um, to continue to, to um, elevate this, this vision. Um, they've gotten all nine counties to sign resolutions in support of 500 miles by 2025 um, and 100 municipalities to sign that resolution so that when a project comes up, they can point back and say, hey, you." are part of this vision and, and how can you help to move it forward? And, and here's what you've committed to, right? Um, there are, uh, as Shay said, a number of, of reports and ways that we're kind of documenting momentum to, um, to continue to motivate partners um, and the government entities responsible for funding these projects. Um, there's an annual report, there's a, a report focused on policy recommendations that comes out every couple of years. Um, and then there are action teams that are helping to um, motivate concerned constituents um, and helping them to take action in support of the trails. Um, and I'll just also say that it's really important to keep that, um, that vision elevated internally. I think like the steering committee meets every month and they talk about all of the, the goals within the strategic plan and how those line up with the vision. Um, you know, they're meeting biannually with the full coalition to, to talk about progress. So, um, so I think all of those things have been helpful. As far as challenges, I mean, if anyone's doing the math, um, you know, 500 miles by 2025, and we've got 375 built now. So there's a, a, a long ways to, to go in a short amount of time. But um, one thing that the coalition can do is really identify what are the policies and practices that can be implemented to help get us closer to those 500 miles. And there are several. Um, so identifying, you know, what those barriers are, what the solutions are, and, and communicating about those with the full strength of the coalition behind those recommendations and that louder voice that the coalition can bring um, to the region to advance those policies and practices. Thank you. That just kind of helped describe so much how the you know, the kind of structure of the coalition, the frequency that they meet, you know, together and constantly keeping their strategic plan and vision top of mind. Um, I know we had a, a, a blurb in the chat there about examples of resolutions. If there's not one in the playbook, we will put one in there. Um, a lot of the trail networks that we work with, including you know all of the ones represented today, have had some form of you know municipal or county resolutions of support. So um, that was a really good suggestion, and we'll be sure to do that if it's not already included in there now. I do want to. Um, go back to you, Shay, to talk a little bit more about um, the city of Fairmont and the other communities within IHTC. They're thinking a lot about how to diversify their economy to try to retain and attract residents. Um, what are some of the stakeholders that you need to be sure are at the table when you're developing trail and active transportation plans? And as a planning director, how have you and, and staff positioned trails to gain and sustain community buy-in and political will? Wow, that is a deep rabbit hole for us here. <laughs> um, and for folks who may not be familiar with um, U.S. Census data, uh, West Virginia is one of the um, only states that are shrinking in population in the country, and uh, majority of all of our counties and municipalities are actually shrinking, including our state capital, Huntington, where I was the former planner, and even Fairmont, where I'm the planning director now. Uh, so, yeah, attracting and retaining businesses and people is very important for us here. Uh, overall, West Virginia, talk about the coalition, extremely important for us to work on this as a collaborative. So for stakeholders, we need housing developers, homeowners, short-term rental business owners, all the third, third space service industries, right, restaurants, coffee shops, breweries, um, all the potential uh, entrepreneurs to open up the new businesses such as bike shops and equipment rental businesses, uh, it might surprise you all, although we are the terminus of two different trails here in West Virginia, we don't have a single bike shop in our cities. So, right, we need to bring these people to the table and have all these stakeholders here, including our existing uh, trail um, networks, our existing uh, trail nonprofits. So shout out to the Mon River Trail Conservancy and Montague County and the amazing work they do and Marion County Parks Recreation for the amazing work they do here. 
as well. Uh, we need law enforcement, hospitals, and the public school system here uh, because of the unique elements in Fairmont and in the region that we're working on. So all of these stakeholders are necessary in the work of Fairmont because of the number of places and synergies that the plan seeks to make. Uh, so the city discusses trails as multimodal transportation, brownfield cleanup, public health improvements, economic development, quality of place improvement to be more competitive in the 21st century economy. Because let's face it, with so many companies being digital in uh, their work, to be competitive in the current economy, your community needs to have a quality of place first to attract those employees and company owners, along with you know all the people that would come with that as well and directly. So they're going to choose the place um, that they want to be based on their personal preference. It's not necessarily based upon the resource they need to extract anymore or the commercial freight routes, although we have those two. Um, but that's why they're not going to they're not going to pick Fairmont based on that. It's going to be the quality of place. Um, so we're really heavily focusing on that. And we believe the trails and all the amenities we're going to construct with the trails and all these things we invite the private um, side of the economy to invest in to be part of that initiative and access. So looking at trails through those different lenses, that's how we've been able to kind of capture a lot of different funding too. Uh, and really bring a lot of different uh, people to the table. So Ken, I don't know if we want to bring up yeah. that slide. Um, so we here in Fairmont, uh, so that's just an example of like one of our, um, we're literally building on an active industrial site too. That's the West Fork River area. <laughs> we're actually closing on in about a couple of weeks. Uh, so that's a lower bench there. And you can see still active industrial uses over to the left. Um, so these are some of the challenges we have. And that's actually right there. That is the photograph of the flattest section of trail <laughs> in our city. That is the most beautiful flat section of land we have that we're going to build anything on. <laughs> um, okay, so I wanted to, with the next image, it kind of shows a breakdown. What we've done is we've, uh, with the PDP study, we looked at a number of corridors and we broke those down into smaller sections. And then we looked at all the various things we needed to do to fund those. Um, and so we came up with the cost estimates based on the P2P study of what it would take to actually implement the trail across these areas. Now, this map here in particular, I want to stress, is our primary choices, our first choices of where to build. We have plans B and C as well. Uh, we're ready for anything. So um, looking through these different lenses, we've been able to bring in EPA assessment and cleanup grant funding. We've been able to do transportation, alternative grants, tax increment, finance district funding. Um, we've also received financial support from the Marion County Chamber of Commerce, uh, right? Because this is about economy, the 21st century economy. Being competitive. So they have bought land and transferred it to the city to assist with this. And they're making other investments as well as our partnerships. Um, we have the Marion County Visitors Bureau because uh, they see how important trails are to uh, attracting people just to stop in and check things out. Um, we're also receiving donations from a number of other institutions, such as Main Street Fairmont here, the RTC, thank you, Kelly and RTC for all of its support, um, and then WVU Hospital here in West Virginia has also been a support in order to help us address those public health outcomes. Those are one of the things we're doing. Speaking of public health, come, public health outcomes and all of our stakeholders and looking at that, that was one of the other unique things that we're currently completing. So we can't showcase it yet, but it'll be out really soon. We used EPA funding for a public health assessment, particularly on the neighborhood where we will be building our major trailhead and most of our uh, trail gap will be built uh, into. So it's called the Beltline neighborhood. It's an it's called that because that's where most of our factors used to be. Uh, so <laughs> cute little nickname there. And um, so we are doing that because we want to make sure that the work we're doing is having those positive impacts on the people who already live there, not just the new, not just the visitors and the people we're trying to attract to join our community. We want to make sure we're also helping the people who are already here uh, as well. So, because uh, some of the things that we need to address, and which is part of that, and then I'll get to the TIF district funding is, you know, obesity and mental health are very large health issues here in Central Appalachia. And so we're definitely working on that and getting people outdoors, getting people better neighborhoods, getting people exercise will hopefully have positive impacts on all of that. We have a massive shortage of medical care and um, access to those services here within the region, uh, despite having a phenomenal hospital system. But it's part of just 
access usually because of affordability and uh, some of the existing poverty conditions that are here and the environmental conditions that those people are subjected to. Um, so one of the great parts about buy-in and support because of this coalition, all the things happening. So right, none of this would be possible without everyone I've mentioned already, plus 20, 30 other partners I haven't mentioned yet. But six years ago, our city council passed a tax increment finance district. And so that's a map there on the screen. And the red dash lines is our municipal boundary. This district covers nearly the entirety of our city, but it leaves out some other parts, but it covers the area it does specifically because this is everywhere we intend to construct the trail and its amenities. So this gave us access to a finance option to place money into a capital fund separately, this TIF fund, that will then be used for acquisition, construction, or any other services we need to actually implement this vision that we have. None of this would have been possible without that political buy-in. This was a big, big ask politically to take our ad valorem, our property taxes. And what we do is we take the increase every year and we set it aside in a separate fund. And so that's what this is. Uh, so the first year to implement, it's really challenging because your city's budget basically doesn't increase for a whole year in order to make this happen. So that was a big political ask, but it was something necessary to make us successful and to make us a leader in getting this done. And so city council has already allocated two and a half million dollars out of that TIF fund in order just to implement uh, the first half of this trail gap closure. Um, which will also include most of the um, smaller bridges that we need and a lot of the infrastructure necessary. So that's been um, huge for us. And so once again, I want to stress, none of this would be possible, I don't believe, without the overall vision of P2P and the IHTC uh, to tie this all into a bigger picture and the existing successes going on. Thank you so much, Shay. I know that I'm sure everyone appreciated seeing the budget breakdown and the slide of different sources that you were able to get to help fund the project. So that was a really important um, bit of information that I felt the, the group should hear, especially as I know some communities struggle maybe with certain types of, of federal funds if you know it's really competitive to get a transportation alternative grants you know are there other federal sources or state sources that where trail building might be eligible and I think you've just been really you know Fairmont has done a really wonderful job of utilizing some of those EPA sources as well to look at you know cleanup and trail and trail development holistically so that is really great. I, I want to be sure that we have time to touch on such an important part, a thread that is within all of the elements that we include in the playbook. It is kind of overarching all of them, and that is around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we know that centering those are really important in every phase of trail network building. Our friends at the Pennsylvania Environmental Environmental Council produced a really great inclusionary trail planning toolkit that we'll post in the chat for the circuit trails and William Penn Foundation supported that. Michelle, can you tell us a little bit more about how the coalition is addressing equity and inclusion in both planning and promoting the circuit trails? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, part of the 2022 strategic plan for the Circuit Trails Coalition um, was to uh, expand its focus um, to really focus on ensuring that trails going in the ground are planned in an inclusive way and that the trails that already exist are accessible, welcoming, and safe um, to everyone and specifically meet the needs of non-traditional users, um, which include people of color. Um, so the, the circuit, I think, was ahead of the game in some respects um, with developing the inclusionary trail planning toolkit, um, which they did in 2018 and ran um, some workshops on that for uh, circuit trails members um, who are now using that toolkit um, in their in their day to day. Um, there are a couple of other planning aspects that um, have the circuit coalition has put forward. There's a gap analysis tool that's relatively new that's helping members identify how trail segments can meet the needs of disinvested communities. So it's really helping to prioritize trails that are in areas with high population density, that have high concentrations of racial and ethnic minorities, and that have high concentrations of um, low income populations. So really helping um, 
organizations figure out where to where to focus next as they're considering um, trail development and, and completing gaps within the network. Um, there's a similar effort ongoing around community connections from the neighborhoods into the trails. Um, and then I mentioned earlier that the foundations provides um, capital funding to the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, and we recently provided a grant focus specifically on um, trail segments in areas with um, that they call them indicators of potential disadvantage. That's sort of our MPO's way of defining um, areas with low income, with higher concentrations of racial and ethnic minorities. Um, they look at language and age and all sorts of things. So um, several things on the docket for, for the planning piece of things. Um, and then I wanna also mention that the coalition did um, an amazing job putting together um, a study called that resulted in um, a report called the Equity of Access to Trails Report. Um, and that drew on focus groups and surveys of people in color, people of color in um, four circuit trails communities. Uh, and it found that, not surprisingly, people of color want to be outside, they want to be on the trails, but there were barriers to, um, to use and there were racial disparities in terms of how the trails were being used and who was using them. Um, so several recommendations coming out of that study, there's a two page, um, summary of that that might be useful for folks to see. Um, but one one thing coming out of it that I'll mention is that you know people want to see other people like them on the trails. Um, and so I talked about Rails to Trails communications efforts on behalf of the coalition, which has really authentically represented um, a, a wide array of trail users. And um, something else we're really excited about is a community regrants program that's providing mini grants to organizations led by people of color and serving people of color to activate the trails. Um, so you know, helping to promote the trails through these activation um, activities, things like birding and art and um, healing walks, all kinds of things that are maybe a little bit um, not within the wheelhouse of the, you know, sort of traditional trail organizations, but that are helping to activate the trails and are helping to form relationships with organizations that um, could eventually become more involved in the Circuit Trails Coalition. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. There's a learning community, Thanks, also, which I think is, is great. Yeah, so many great resources and it really, you know, kind of what you were saying at the end gets at one of the other important elements of the playbook, which is engagement and you just can't sometimes overemphasize how the the programming, um, you know, and and offering other types of activities so that the trails are really seen as welcoming and also um, available for all different types of uses. So that was that was very helpful. I want to turn it over to Judy before we ha ask one last question, um, and then we'll get to some Q and Q and A audience Q and A here. Judy, in in the preparation for the webinar, you made a really important point about how these projects don't necessarily need to be located in well resourced areas, and you know that's clear in both your area in South Texas and and in West Virginia as well. Um, could you tell us more about how communities can leverage different types of opportunities to, to support their networks if they might be in an under-resourced place? Well, I think I, I, you know, you will just run right to your own pile of problems when you look at everyone else's problems, right? Um, and so I remember thinking when Shay was talking about this, the struggles around the brownfields and all of those sorts of environmental issues, we don't have any of those in our area. But we are very under-resourced. Again, being one of the poorest areas in Texas, you know, um, our county's less than 500,000 people, which is also important to know because funding has gone to counties of over 500,000 and not just like a little bit more, but tremendously more resources going to counties that are even just a little bit larger than ours. So there are several um, hurdles like that to get through. But you know, people really do love to collaborate and they are committed to that. And so when you have that sense of teamwork, you can really get a whole lot done. And so all of those groups coming together to try to expand access, especially in our area, um, has been really a joy to see and a joy to work with. So I do think it's possible. And in some cases, you really have to see it to believe it and to be able to dream it for your own area. So 
I think examples such as today and the playbook is such a great resource for those who are further behind like we are in terms of development. So currently it's it's really all about the infrastructure and less about engagement and education because everyone's so focused on just getting some things built at this point. Right. Thank you. And before we go to a couple audience questions, just wanted a quick round robin of, you know, for each of you, your your single most important piece of advice to advocates and practitioners that are working together to develop trail networks. And we can start with Michelle. Um, I would say don't undervalue the importance of relationships and continuing that drumbeat of the vision with all the partners. Great. Shay? Um, I think just to, to build on that, plan and build in a way that is as inclusive as possible. Think about how the connections you can make to the business districts, the parks, the schools, neighborhoods, and more, all of the amenities that are possible and how these details impact so many different pieces of our lives. That will create natural buy-in and support across your communities and begin bringing people to the table that you may not have been aware, had the resources to help and make the trail not only a reality, but a big success. Thanks, Shay. Judy? Well, I think it's important to remember that trails make neighborhoods safer. Um, and when there are more people out and about, then the whole neighborhood benefits from that. Uh, I think we've had some resistance in some areas that that trail's too close and things like that. But that that's the part of education that's really important to let people know that this is actually a huge, you know, improvement to the area. And for our, you know, bus system that I think we we wanted to make sure we talked about the active transport piece. We have a very limited bus system, but it does, it does allow for someone to pop on with a bicycle and then pop off. And so the goal is that, you know, people will be able to maneuver through the county in a variety of ways, whether on a bus or bicycle or by foot or whatever the case may be. So our hope is that we'll continue to build that out and see that. And um, and we're thrilled for all of the groups that help participate. I saw in the chat that the Rio Grande Valley MPO has been very involved and they have since the since day one. Um, and that has been really important. And the continued regional approach is, I think, what's going to be the winning ticket for us. That's great. That kind of transitions to a question that we have around building regional political will and support from MPOs. I mean, we know that there's a really strong MPO in the Philadelphia region, the Del Delaware Valley um, Regional Planning Commission. And Judy, you just mentioned um, the Lower Rio Grande Valley MPO too is being um, particularly invested and supported. Um, this Alan Moore's question, he's from Boston, and he says, you know, in general, there are lots of strong local organizations, many are volunteer that are doing a lot with varying support from the municipalities. Coalitions exist, but suffer from no paid staff. How have these and others funded their coalition? And, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about, yeah, how the coalition is supported. I'm happy to jump in as well, but just any thoughts around building political will so that it can actually fund the work of the coalition to push the vision forward. And I'm thinking, you know, for, for the audience, of course, both the William Penn Foundation and the Valley Baptist Legacy Foundation play a big role in supporting the coalition work in, in their regions. Um, I know in the industrial Heartland Trails region, the coalition is so big and there's not a single paid staff. It's more the collective effort of the groups who are helping to kind of lead the initiative and then all of the different partners. So it is, it can be really challenging when you're trying to coordinate um, a lot of groups together towards a singular vision without that consistency and, and you know, um, support staff basically. But I think that, you know, it, it can, point to the importance of kind of thinking about that maybe as you're going along in either establishing what your vision and your trail network might look like to see 
what opportunities there are to connect your vision with an organization or a, a lead group that has um, existing staff support. Um, but I don't know if anybody else wanted to talk a little bit about just political will building in general. And, yeah, Shay. Yeah, I think um, just from our experience here within the IHTC down in uh, the West Virginia portion, it's it's been a lot to uh, to try to always advocate to having those technical experts around. Um, a lot of times for us, private industry ends up filling the gaps. Uh, you know, a lot of us, a lot of our county cities here that are involved in this hire the same companies uh, in order to do the design work or the planning work that's needed beyond the P2P study. And uh, but then as well, we sh we try to pull and share our existing technical expertise as much as possible, because that can be a big barrier here. Um, right. Most of our counties uh, barely have a population over 50,000 people. So when we just look at the resources we already have to pull from in terms of um, individuals, it's it's limited. And so we do try to share and that political will can help. It's uh, like when we get calls from Harrison County Commission, they're like, how did you figure out to do this in order to solve your problems? And it's like, well, we we're fortunate to have a staff member that maybe understands those things, right? We got somebody who understands uh, horticulture, we got somebody who understands civil engineering. And so we try to uh, pull our resources well and say, hey, we'll be here to support you. And also, but realize we're limited. So um, if you're serious about this, you need to invest in those types of staff members and so forth too, and to not just rely on proper. So we've, we've kind of been addressing it both ways. It's either outsourcing or uh, sharing or trying to encourage other groups to hire those Thank technical you. experts to help out. Yeah, that kind of gets at somebody else's question kind of around um, if, you, if you're not in an area that's served by an MPO, right, you might have something like a regional or a rural planning commission. It might be the municipalities themselves that are, are really providing those services. And Shay, I think you made a really great point about how, you know, private sector industry can also play a role there to in terms of offering services and support that might not be present through an existing MPO um, if you're in, in a more rural area. I do, I know we're coming up on two o'clock. I, I wanted to take a moment just for one last question that we got before um, in the registration phase. This was from Kelly Davis of the Outdoor Industry Association and she wanted to know and, and think a little bit around how we can better determine the demand for trail systems. Once a trail is built, how can we understand how users consume the experiences available on that trail? So just really quickly, I don't know if any of you would like to speak a little bit about um, measuring trail use and demand. I can I'll mention you. one quick thing. Oh, sorry, Michelle. And that no, is that we have funded um, trail counters for the the actual trails that we've had built out and we've given that responsibility to our local cog with who offices with our mpo our regional mpo so that the data is all in one place the same kind of counters for trails all over our our actually more than two county area and hopes that they share the data broadly every municipality has access to their own and it's measuring the type of you know the type of user whether it's someone that's on foot or a bicycle and and we're hoping that that helps show us the continued growth and demand as other trails get built out thanks michelle we've done the same thing for the circuit trail so um and i would just say as far as like type of activity the focus groups that we did a couple of years ago were really helpful in identifying how people wanted to use the trails and how they were currently using the trails Thank you all so much. Um, there, there's more information on trail counts and you know measuring use and experience um, in the playbook and in our toolbox online. Wanted to thank you all so much for your time and for sharing your experiences in your different trail networks. Um, we had a lot of great comments in the chat. 
we'll be posting this recording along with links that were shared and answers to other questions that weren't answered um, here in a few days. They'll be on our website. We want everybody to know about some upcoming events. We've got um, continued um, continuation of this webinar series throughout the year, and we hope you'll join us. And we'll be at the International Trails Summit in Reno, Nevada in April. Hope to see some of you there. Thanks again, everyone, for your time. Um, we hope that you'll continue to join us for all of these things, spread the word about the coalition and or about the collaborative, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Michelle, Shay, and Judy, and thank you all. Thank you.